Hello, and welcome to Sonata She Wrote. This week, I am discussing my analysis of Felix Mendelssohn's Overture to a Midsummer Night's Dream, Opus 21. Written when Mendelssohn was only 16 years old, and called by Sir George Grove of New Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians fame, the greatest marvel of early maturity that the world has ever seen in music, which is a fairly positive review. This piece is different than many that I've analyzed before in that it has its own extra musical program, which complements the dramatic trajectory of its form. The program in question being, of course, Shakespeare's comedy, A Midsummer Night's Dream. The play, in five acts, has several parallel storylines happening at once. Theseus and Hippolyta, Athenian nobility, are to be married. A group of amateur actors, referred to as the Mechanicals because of their working class status, solidarity forever, are rehearsing a play in the hopes of performing it at the reception of that wedding. A group of four lovers are attempting to sort out their own intertwining love stories and marry their appropriate partner. And against the entire backdrop, the fairy king and queen, Oberon and Titania, are quarreling over a servant of some kind. Oberon enlists the help of his own trickster servant, Puck, to bamboozle everyone's love interests, including his own wife, who finds herself in love with one of the mechanicals, Bottom, whose human head has been transformed into a jackass's head, also by Puck. Of course, misunderstandings ensue between the four lovers and the mechanicals. Only Nick Bottom, the donkey-headed boy, is happy, of course, as a fairy queen is now in love with him. Having achieved his goals, which were apparently to make his own wife look like a fool, Oberon arranges for everything to be set right, including allowing the four lovers to marry the most appropriate partner. The two couples of lovers are married simultaneously with the Athenian nobility, and in the final act, the mechanicals stage their play, or their play within a play, if you will. The fairies return briefly for some monologues, and the play concludes. Between 1797 and 1810, August Wilhelm Schlegel published German translations of the works of Shakespeare, and a reissue of his translation of A Midsummer Night's Dream in 1825 likely provided Mendelssohn's exposure to the work. The composer and music theorist Adolf Bernhard Marx, whose name was designed in a lab to bother every side of the political spectrum, wrote in his own memoir about the genesis of the piece. A young Mendelssohn approached him with the work and received some criticism that it bore little connection to the play itself. Apparently, this criticism was at first taken poorly before young Mendelssohn asked for some tutelage, which Marx apparently happily gave him. So how will the story be presented musically? Well, various themes represent various characters, or most often, groups of characters in the play. I haven't been able to find any corroboration of this in Mendelssohn's own words, but its basis seems to largely rest on the later composed incidental music, which is meant to accompany the play, in which certain themes in the overture correspond to certain events and characters in the play. I think this may be the longest I've gone without any music to discuss in a video, so I'll introduce the themes and characters as they appear in the music. In relation to the four opening chords that form the slow introduction of this overture, I think the course Music Theory 1 has biased many of us towards believing that four always leads to five in a cadence, when in reality, two or two six is a much more common predominant. Having said that, the tonic expansion of these four chords in the order of one, five, minor four, one, is a little otherworldly. 
The music is meant to represent the woods outside the city of Athens, where much of the story takes place. This is followed by the fairy music, which seems to be in E minor. You no doubt see the key signature, either E major or C sharp minor. We just heard music which appeared to be in E major, but the fairies represent another world, a reality which only occasionally syncs up with that of the play. Now, the minor mode makes sense in the context of a play, but how will Mendelssohn square it up with a sonata form, as a minor mode sonata has a much different set of expectations than a major mode sonata? What Mendelssohn is doing here is using these cadences, which, though complete in the strings, are blocked by the winds, to reject the mode of this initial P theme, stopping it from establishing the key of E minor as the main key of the overture. The music then shifts into P1.2, which would be the quote-unquote real primary theme of the piece, meaning the one which cadences and does establish the mode of E major. P1.2 is meant to represent the Athenian royal court. Within the time frame of the play, it makes sense to use the fairy theme and the court as the primary themes. Act 1 largely takes place at court, and Act 2 largely in the fairy world, but it's made clear in the play that both these acts are happening simultaneously in the timeline. Ergo, they are both the initial condition primary theme of our sonata form. The boundary between P1.1 and TR isn't exactly clear. It's possible to label this as a P-TR merger, but when I listen to this piece, I experience this point in the music as a cadence. The primary theme often has cadences, whereas the transition rarely has cadences. So this measure is my dividing line. Generally the transition proceeds according to plan the fairy theme making a brief appearance in TR 1.2 before a normative half-cadence medial caesura in the dominant B major. At this point, we have a concept which is new for the channel. We've discussed P0 modules before, but this is our first S0 module. Each of the thematic zones, P most often, and then S and C after that, 
might begin with a preparatory module that precedes the actual theme itself. The lightest type of S0 module appears as a type of rhythmic vamping in advance of the actual secondary theme, which I believe is what we have here. Hepikoski and Darcy even use this overture as an example, pointing out its rotary, non-progressive effect. The main S1 theme which follows is a representation of the four human lovers and the chaos that surrounds their mismatched desire. Yes, you got me. This is yet another tri-modular block. I think I'll probably have to deliberately pick a piece with only one S theme next, just to prove they exist. You probably know by now, but in case you've missed it, a tri-modular block is an exposition which has two medial caesuras and two S themes, with a formal zone in between, which generally has the rhetoric of a transition. They're a compositional device used by composers to highlight the titanic struggle of a secondary theme to reach cadence. In the case of this overture, the initial secondary theme representing the lovers, its failure to cadence makes perfect sense. The lovers are in complete disarray even before Puck plays with their hearts. They are incapable of solving the problems of this exposition alone. In the second transition, TR2, away from S1.1, I want to draw your attention to this theme here. In sonata theory, it's clear that this is a separate thematic zone with a separate theme. It doesn't always appear in analyses of this movement, and I'll expand on that a bit more later. The second S theme, S2, which TR2 leads to, is probably the most famous theme of this piece. It's meant to represent the actors or mechanicals. It's also a musical representation of a donkey braying. Remember that one of the mechanicals, Nick Bottom, has been transformed into a terrifying donkey man hybrid. The mechanicals S theme does reach a central closure here in bar 222 and is followed by two closing themes, both of the Royal Athenians. The hunting party here and a P-based closing zone, which uses the theme of the court. Now, we've come up to the start of the development, which is where I often take an intermission, especially with a piece of this length, but I thought I would try putting everything in one part for this video. Let me know if you prefer this longer video or the old system of two parts. And speaking of audience participation, let me take this moment to recognize and thank my patrons, which you see on the screen. If you have the means and want to support me, head over to Patreon, the link is in the description. Back to the music, 
Considering the banger of an exposition Mendelssohn just put us through, this development is relatively sparse. It's built around the initial fairy theme with some interspersed fairy calls from the S1 lovers and includes a few espressivo repetitions of the TR2 theme, which I'm calling Love Gone Wrong. I did attempt to track down this theme in the incidental music, but unfortunately I couldn't find it. Personally, I hear it as a representation of Oberon's better nature at seeing his wife in love with a donkey man freak. But maybe I just want to believe that Oberon can be better than he really is. Tonally, the focus of the development has so far been around two, F-sharp minor, and six, C-sharp minor, fairly normative options for a sonata development in the classical period. But this is 1825, and Mendelssohn knows how to get freaky too. We're about to drop the references to the lover's theme in the fairies and move through a real tonal oddball, D major, before moving back into C-sharp minor for a tragic sounding of TR2. I'm going to give away the game a bit because I want to lay some groundwork. At the beginning of the recapitulation, Mendelssohn has set us back in the music of the woods, the slow introduction. Within the sonata form, it reminds me of Beethoven's use of the commenting slow introduction in his Patatique Sonata, which typically reminded us of what a lost cause the hope of a major transformation was. Mendelssohn's music acts more as a narrator, scene setter, or even a curtain. But I especially want to draw your attention to the opening notes of this wind chorale. Although the same as the opening of the piece, here they sound wonderfully ambiguous after the development. And without the context of a score, I think it would be confusing whether this was going to continue in C sharp minor or E major.
Expanded in length somewhat, the initial feeling is that we might still be in the minor mode. Although the chorale is in major, the fairy theme seems more sinister than ever. The music leads us into a blocked medial caesura. Although it initially appears the fairies are receding back into the woods, they re-emerge to block this point of cadence before the lover's theme opens again. Perhaps this is Mendelssohn's musical representation of Oberon ordering Puck to set everything to right? The otherworldly flat six here emphasizes a sense that we've left reality. Absent a transition, and with a blocked medial caesura, the lovers, S1.1, only sounds as an S theme at all because of its reference to the previous rotation. Although the thematic zones before the potential medial caesura are distorted, or in the case of the courtly P1.2, entirely absent, much of the music beginning with S1.1 initially corresponds to the exposition. Mendelssohn is opening the same trimodular block as before. S1.1 initially tries for a cadence here, but is thwarted by its own repetition, and makes a second attempt here that is blocked by chromatic leading tones in violin and flute. In the exposition, the original transition opened with a fanfare in the winds, and the same effect is used here to move us into S2, the mechanical theme. Although relatively rustic harmonically as it was before, the theme seems unable to cadence. Enter the original first transition from the exposition. Although chronologically out of place in the recapitulation, it's not too unusual for themes to appear in a different order than in expositions. In fact, it's one of Haydn's main innovations in sonata form. In terms of the program, this music, closely related to the fairy theme, not so much in terms of its melodic material, although you can find that if you want to, but rather close in the literal sense, as it appeared directly after the fairy music, I feel that TR1 in this location emphasizes the way the kooky situation of this play was set right by the supernatural force of the fairies. Don't give them too much credit, though. Remember, they did mess it up in the first place. 
The TR1 material, after a little too much focus on two F sharp minor for comfort, does manage to cadence perfectly in bar 586 and reach the essential structural closure. A closing zone based on the missing P1.2 music closes the sonata before moving on to a coda. But before we dissect the coda, really its own beast with interesting concepts, I'd like to discuss an analysis of this piece centered around a germinating tetrachord motive by Dr. R. Larry Todd, a professor at Duke University. You may have noticed permanent red circles on my score. These circles are meant to be indicators of Dr. Todd's theory of motivic compression, which is much easier to understand once all the themes are known. I'll show his own writing on the screen with his own chart of the themes. Essentially, Dr. Todd is making the claim that many of the themes of this sonata form are based on the opening tetrachord. A tetrachord is a group of four notes, which are typically scalar and most often span a perfect fourth, which can be plucked out of the slow introduction chords. So let's start there. You can see these circles represent the four notes Dr. Todd is discussing. Do these four notes in this form make a motive? Maybe? If they do, it's not an audible one. But I do like the mode mixture inherent to choosing E, D sharp, C natural, and B, which is then reflected with both major and a minor P theme. Dr. Todd's main argument is that as the exposition progresses, the themes compress the tetrachord from a perfect fourth down to a major second by the end of the closing zone. I have a couple of issues with this idea. First, let's look at his D theme, my S1.1, which is the lovers. You can see that Todd has chosen this set of chromatic notes, which span a minor third as the first compression. The issue here is that the tetrachord is meant to appear at the beginning of a theme, and this portion of the theme isn't the beginning, it's the middle. So if we're going to circle a tetrachord, it probably should be this, which is a perfect fourth. The second problem with the group of notes that Todd shows here is that they span a minor third. But immediately following this section in TR2, we have a completely new theme in a distinct zone that has somehow expanded back into the opening perfect fourth. For his next example, E or my S2, the mechanicals, has chosen a major third, which, if you compress the minor ninth down to a second, comprises what he considers to be the second compression. A compressure which, as a major third, is actually larger than what he claimed the previous compression was, a minor third. His final example is the hunt party, my closing zone, which he claims is a compression down to a major second. I know it sounds like I'm being dismissive of his idea, but actually, I don't entirely disagree with the idea of a germinating motif. I just think it only applies to certain areas of the music, and I don't quite buy the theory that they compress over time. I would apply this tetrachord motif to the primary themes, the first S theme, and the second transition. As a group, this selection of themes all have in common the fact that they are representative of the material in this sonata, which is unable to reach structural cadence whereas the music which is not based on this germinating cell is able to cadence in a sonata form. To me, these seem like more realistic and more audible categories of themes. It's not really my intention to slam Dr. Todd, but when I discover in my research that another theorist has already analyzed the piece I'm working with, I feel like I should discuss it. If I had completely agreed with Dr. Todd's analysis, I probably wouldn't have made this video. Now, to the coda.
Like the slow introduction, the coda is a parageneric zone, somewhat outside the reality of the sonata it follows. In this case, Mendelssohn's coda is engaging with a concept that Hepikoski and Darcy discuss at length in their chapter on parageneric spaces, or spaces outside of the generic sonata form. They write that the introduction and coda, when in a frame, often subordinate the material within a sonata form, elevating the slow introduction and coda to a higher plane above the reality of the sonata form. This overture is even specifically used to demonstrate this point in the elements of sonata theory. The simple affairs of the lesser humans, the sonata form at large, end. But the fairies and the world around Athens persists into eternity. I hope you enjoyed this analysis of Mendelssohn's Overture to a Midsummer Night's Dream. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them below, and don't forget to subscribe.